Well, I was telling you um, last week that I was going to leave the service and go straight to our broth, where I was going to be playing guitar for a charity, and uh, all nervous about that all week, had, you know, played my fingers raw so that I'd have enough stamina to be able to do that. Um, and then got there, of course, was still nervous. And then the, there was a girl who got up and played before me who sounded a bit, you know, like, um, uh, you know, Shania Twain or something. And here I was going, oh, great. You know, I've got to follow this act. And then as I got up to play, um, the guy said, uh, I'm really sorry, but can you play this other guitar? I'd brought my own, you know. And I said, oh, uh, and he said, because it's all plugged in and ready to go. And I said, uh, okay. And so I got that <clears throat> and then began to play. And I had agreed to play with the um, lady who was kind of organizing for her daughter for an hour. And so I was all ready to play. And 40 minutes in, the guy said, can you just do one more and end it? And I thought, oh, gosh, you know, is it that bad? <laughs> you know? And so uh, I ended up playing that one. And then realized later that actually they were all half-hour sets and he hadn't clear, she hadn't cleared it with him. And so he thought I was 10 minutes over and I thought I was 20 minutes early. So, but it was a lot of fun. And I've never done that kind of thing before where I was actually up on a stage playing to a bunch of people. And, um, yeah, if you haven't ever done anything out of your comfort zone before, you need to do it. It challenges you. It makes you do, you know, it makes you stretch beyond and you think, oh, you know, I really, I am just not normally um, that kind of a bold person. But it, it's similar to what happened to me the first time I busked when I was in Oxford and get out on the street and play. Except there, nobody's paying attention to you, so it's okay. You can make mistakes, you can adjust, and it's really no problem at all. But when you're up on a stage and you're amplified, you got to get it right. So anyway, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad I don't have to do that again. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to be continuing, um, at which uh, this series ends next week. Richard will be bringing us a message uh, from the book of uh, Habakkuk. But um, today's is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But before I read these two verses, 9 and 10, and we look at them, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, the question is kind of to set the stage for you, to prepare you to hear from God, to hear what the Lord has to say to you. Because sometimes I think we come to church and we don't know why. That's a bit of a strange you know, thing to say, but sometimes we do things so routinely that we really don't know why, other than the fact that that's what you do on Sunday morning. You know, still, if you're a Christian and you're committed to Christ, you come. So I would just ask you the question and want you to answer in your own heart. What is it you want from God or from this service today? What is it that you really need is there some area of your heart that needs ministering to? Is there some, you know, pressing uh, area of difficulty that you need comfort? You need to know the Lord's presence? Is it just because you're here to feed upon his word? And all these are good reasons. There's no wrong reason uh, when it comes to that. But why are you here this morning? And if you ask that yourself that question and prepare your own heart, I think you'll be much more likely to be able to walk away a bit more fulfilled, a bit more maybe content, we might say, but be able to say, I've heard from God, I have something that I believe he's spoken to me about. Because um, 
As nice looking as I might be, I know you didn't come just to look at me. You came because you want to hear what God has to say through his word. And so that's the kind of communication we all desire. And I say that because I believe God speaks to me through these as well. And there are times as I've prepared sermons and as I've um, you know, gotten ready that I feel like God's already preached this sermon to me before I bring it to you. As I'm preparing, I feel like, you know, I I fall under conviction. I'm able to pray. And in some cases, it puts me in a position of having already heard this and already gotten right with God or already adjusted uh, my life for it. But then there are times when I'm up here speaking. And as I'm speaking, I think of something that isn't necessarily in the notes, and I think, oh, that was good. You know, and, I, and you feel bad about saying it because you think, I can't compliment myself, you know, in, in the message. But there have been times that I felt like God was actually speaking to me through me. And I know that's a bit difficult to, to, to get your head around. But sometimes God just speaks to all of us at the same time and in a corporate way and yet very individually. Very specific for our lives. So before we even read these verses, let's just pray and let's ask God to speak to us. Let's ask God to meet the need that we have. Father, we've all come to church this morning, to this gathering of believers that we love in this place that we cherish because we want to be close to you. We want to be obedient to the command that we feel you've given us to gather together, assemble ourselves together. But Father, we've all come from different places, not just geographically, but in life. Some of us are hurting physically. Some of us are grieving. Some of us are uh, in need, have needs that are just overwhelmingly on our mind. Some of us are at a, a good place at the moment we don't hurt, at the moment we don't have any needs. And Father, we just want to, to be here to fellowship, to enjoy your presence and to be with others and maybe encourage others by us being here. But Father, whatever it is, all of it surrounds around gathering at your feet, just sitting and listening to you knowing and feeling your presence, being called by your name and being collectively gathered together to it. And so, Father, as your promise says that you will gather with us when we gather to you, we invite you here, Lord. We want you to be at work in each of our hearts and lives. We pray that you'd speak to us, say something to us special, Lord, something that will grip us and will hold our attention, that will change us, make us even better Christians, might challenge us and help us to get right, recalibrated onto what you want us to be and want us to do. And Father, some of us need to be surprised. Some of us need to be awakened. Some of us need to be revived. And I pray that you do that where it's necessary to. But Father, above all, we want to know you more. As some use the words, we want to press in to you, to feel your everlasting arms wrapped around us. And to know that you love us and that you care. So Father, be in this room today. Sweep across it. May your Holy Spirit prepare our hearts. We listen carefully and intently to what you have to say. And thank you already for what you'll do. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> and we're going to read just two verses of Scripture today. Verse 9, <clears throat> but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, this is the message that makes no earthly sense. When you think about these two verses of Scripture, they are contrary to about 99% of everything you're hearing in the world today about being positive and about, uh, you know, um, self help and uh, gratification and success and everything that we're being pumped with in this day and age is all about strength. We love words like, in fact, they're biblical based and yet they, they creep into the world, Str uh, going from strength to strength, iron sharpening iron. We like strength. We like power. We like a sense of being able to succeed and go forward and uh, achieve. Eve, all of those words are very, very common in our culture. And then Paul throws this spanner in the works, you know. He throws this, these two verses out there and he says, glory to God, I'm weak. You know, he says, I thank God I'm infirmed. I'm ill. I, it, just, it just doesn't get better than this. And it just makes absolutely no earthly sense. Just look at verse 10 again. He says, this is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. In fact, I love insults. Can you imagine meeting somebody, you know, just I can't wait to be insulted again. It just, it just makes me glow, you know, just say something else bad about me. You know, Paul was just, it was like he was this total masochist, you know, hit me again, you know, and, and I, he probably took that, you know, verse about Jesus saying, turn the other cheek, he, he want to do it again, you know, just come on, keep hitting me. And there's just this sense of all of it that just doesn't make any earthly sense at all. In hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. But then he's getting somewhere with this. So I'm going to make a few points, and I only have four. But when it comes to these, I think they really scream out to us about contentment. Because when it comes to contentment, We've got to, if we're going to ever achieve contentment, really godly contentment, we're going to have to do it in strength and weakness. Because face it, in life, most of the time, things are difficult. Occasionally, things are good. You know, and I said that a minute ago, each of us comes in a different uh, kind of condition this morning. Some of us are hurting and, um, and there are others who, who kind of think about it for a minute and say, actually, at the moment, nothing aches. You know, but those are rare times. They're actually more rare. <laughs> maybe they're not. That's, I don't know. Maybe they're, but, you know, there's, it's more rare for us to be actually normal. And there's a, a sense of, um, I, I've thought of this often. Have you ever, I know you have. Have you ever gotten a cramp and, oh, they're painful, you know? And as a teenager, it seemed like I got them all the time. I was weightlifting, swimming, running, playing football, all the kinds of things you do. And then I'd wake in the middle of the night just in excruciating, screaming pain. My duvet would fly off the bed, you know, and I was rubbing my leg and doing all these kinds of things. And it felt absolutely horrible. The pain was unbearable. And then... Finally, the, the cramp would subside, and it would go away. 
And just for a moment, it felt so good to just be normal. You know, it wasn't as if I suddenly felt good. It was the absence of pain that felt good. You know, there was just this sense of, oh, it feels good. I don't want to move because it just feels good to be normal. And I think when we think about all of it, it is in weakness and strength. God wants us to say, if, if we're going to be content, we have to be content, using Paul words, in whatever state we're in. So the first point I want to make is the satisfaction should come in the grace of God. God's grace, resting in God's grace. Look at verse 9. And we're, going to, we're going to do this with verses 9 and 10. We're not going anywhere else this morning, so you can just look at these two verses. But look at verse 9. But he said to me, in speech marks, if you have an NIV, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. We can make this personal by adding the word in your weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. I've thought of this often. I've meditated upon this often uh, because I often feel like a failure in life. You know, I feel like I'm really not the best choice uh, when I was in television, it was quite funny. I was having my exit interview with the chief executive when I was finally leaving media once and for all. And I had this overwhelming sense that took, it, it sent us both into hysterical laughter. But uh, I was in media and in, in television and radio for 28 years, you know. And as I sat on this over in the chief executive's office, and he said, so he said, so how do you feel? And I said, and I told him the truth. You shouldn't always do that to your chief executive. But I, I said, I can't believe I bulled my way through 28 years of knowing nothing about what I was doing. You know, that's just not what you're supposed to say in an exit interview. It's supposed to be, I'm so proud of all the achievements. And I felt like, you know, I was the least likely to succeed when it came to this. And I can't believe I just spent 28 years bullying my way through this whole thing. And that's how I felt, an overwhelming sense of inadequacy. And yet I think as I look at it, maybe that's why God was, using an old American southern phrase, maybe that's why God was so tickled when I achieved because he knew that the credit would be his. And think about that in your own life. When we are weak, he's strong. His ability comes out in our weakness. I have known preachers, loved some of them, you know, who would get in, who would walk into a room, one in particular, I won't mention his name, but he would walk into a room and you could hear his bellowing deep voice. And I used to think, good grief, you know, that man is called. He just, he just radiates authority, leadership, power. You know, everything about his character was, I am a man of God. You know? <laughs> and, you know, and you just knew, you just knew that he radiated with that kind of, and then I come in the, in the room, you know, and I, and I squeak or whatever. I don't know, you, you trip over something, you know, and, and you just feel like, you know, I just don't fit in this role like that, you know. But at the same time, in fact, one, there was one, there's one passage, I'm, I'm getting off the track a bit, but there's one passage in Charles Spurgeon's book where he's talking to his students. It's called Lectures to My Students. And it really bothered me when I read it the first time because in, in it he says, I don't believe if a man isn't, hasn't got a strong voice and, care, and his character doesn't carry in a room of authority that he's called of God to be a pastor. And I thought, what? 
that's, you know, why am I here kind of thing. There was a sense of, you know, but, but of course there was a practical base to it. That was in a day before, before microphones and amplifiers. And if a man couldn't be heard in a huge room full of people, you're wasting your time. If he was up there and he was a bit quiet, everybody would be going, what? What? You know, and so there was a sense of saying you need a robust voice to be able to be heard. So when I understood that, I forgave him, you know, but but there was a sense of saying that actually God gets the greatest credit when we are weak, when we aren't at our best, when we aren't just the icon of success. He gets the glory when we are just weak and he is strong because he becomes our strength. Now, begin now applying that to your own life because I think each of us in this room have weakness about our character. Each of us in this room have times when we feel like, you know, I, shouldn't, I, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I just don't qualify. And, and Satan will really love it when we say that, you know. I, I just don't feel qualified. I don't feel adequate. And then we read these verses that actually God's grace is sufficient for you. The second thing comes up in verse 9. I'm going to use the King James language in this, because I like what it says, for my strength, and, and, and then he, he says, is made, and it says the same in the uh, NIV, in, the, in these words, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Perfect. The perfection, think of these, think of how odd, how strange, how wrong it sounds for me to say this. The perfection of weakness. You know, we buy books all the time by men, I won't name them, who help us drive home how we can be successful, how we can be better, we can do more, we can achieve. And as I've used all those words before, and do we buy books that will teach us how to be weak? You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't. It's not the first one you'd pick up on a shelf. How to become weak. No, you know, because I don't strive for weakness. But believe me, you don't need to. You already are. We already are, you know. When we consider who we are, and all the authors in Scripture will from time to time grasp the smallness of man, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, there's a sense the psalmist would cry out and recognize just how teeny weeny we really are. You know, how small, how insignificant, how uh, incapable and inadequate and all the rest of it. But there is a perfection in weakness, perfection in weakness. The third thing is, and this is where it gets really strange in verse 10, the glory and pleasure of infirmities. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses. Now, you know, it makes no sense at all if you don't have that preface, for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. Because we don't want to be weak for weak's sake, for weakness's sake. We want to be weak for the sake of Christ. So when the, the Bible teaches and, and when Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he was saying, when you come into a room, don't take the front seat and look for the attention, look for the credit, sit in the back. Because the opportunity then is there for you to be moved forward, to be exalted by someone else. Taking on board that attitude, if we were to consider that for ourselves, when, it comes, when we come into a room, and think of this, this is a mental picture that would help us. 
if we come into a room, we are not coming in alone. We're coming in with Christ beside us. That changes everything. If we come in with Christ beside us, then suddenly we, won't, we don't want to push to the front. Do you see what I mean? You, if you come into a room with Christ beside you, then you let him go first. You let him take the preeminent place. You let him step forward and be and do, and you are in his shadow. Because by being with him, that's enough. Just being with him is enough. Rather than to take the preeminent place. We live in culture where, uh, I, I do this, I don't know whether you do, and maybe you're this way, so I won't watch you when you walk out. But I have been where I've walked, watched people walking down the, the streets of this, you know, the town, and you watch, and sometimes you have the man out front. Very, you know what I mean? And then he's, he's walking out front and his wife is trailing behind him. You know, I know. And, and there's this sense, you know, I, I just have these words come out. I'll, you know, I'll say alpha male. You know, it's just the first thing that kicks in. He's leading the pack, you know. And he doesn't even look to see who's behind him because he's, you know. And there is, there is whether we like it or not, there's an aura about that. You know, and then you get the one where the woman is out front and the man is kind of trailing <laughs> behind. You know, okay, that may be more frequent, but no, it happened. And you do you see you see this kind of a timid looking guy kind of following his wife along. You know, and and, and that also paints this picture. And then then of course you get this where you see two. And it's all romantic and gooey, you know, and you see the two holding hands when they're walking. You know, and you just see them and they look like a couple. They look like they're together. They're, there's a sense. Now listen, the man can lead and it doesn't have to look the way I described a minute ago. And the same can be true. The woman can lead and it doesn't have to look as if the man is some cowardly. He might be letting her go first in a, in a you know, single file. It could be all kinds of other reasons. So it's not the specific. It's the attitude. Now think of that when it comes to Christ. I have met preachers, and you have heard them if you've been around long enough. I have met preachers who I would swear think they're more powerful than God. You know, they stand up and they speak with such authority that in healing services, it's as if they're commanding God who's their slave to heal somebody. You know, and you just think to yourself, ooh. It cringe over that kind of thing, you know. Somebody who exor- exerts this kind of authority that oversteps God in a way. And you think, that just doesn't strike me as Christ-like. Because when I saw Jesus and I read in scripture, I, I get a different picture about the way that he went about healing. And I mean, he was God. It is God. You know, but there's a sense that when Jesus healed, he didn't have to, you know, shout for the sake of authority. I think when he shouted at Lazarus, it was because he wanted to be heard. You know, it was a distance. He shouted at him. And there are those who say it's a good thing he said Lazarus, because if he'd have just said arise, he said all of the dead would have gotten up. You know, that would have been something, wouldn't it? Whew. You know, but, you know, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And, and I think when we hear words about what Jesus did, the power wasn't in his volume. It wasn't in his, you know, the way he conducted himself. Instead, some of the most, and think of this in your own life, some of the most powerful people I have ever met were quiet. There was something about them that just... You know, it it had an authority and a power about it, and it didn't necessarily have volume. It didn't have an exertion. That it was as if they were speaking, and I use this in context, speaking from a place of weakness. 
but recognizing the power and the authority that they had in Christ. That's what we were talking about. If your weakness comes because you are letting Christ work through you, then we become conduits of his power. Our weakness means that in our weakness, he can become strong. And wow, the power, wow, the strength that he can exhort, exert through us is just limitless. But we, in order for that to happen, have to, to you know, become weak. I sometimes think God will let us look powerful if we want to. He'll let us do all that stuff. And, and then think of this. The man with power steps back and says, no, really, after you, go on. How humiliating is it when we think, you know, I'll, t- I'll take care of this, Lord. If I need you, I'll call you. Mm-hmm. You know, who are we? You know, but the sense of being able to come forth. Actually, it's to say, you know, you take over. I love words when we read about the archangel, Michael, fighting Satan, and he confronts Satan. I love it. It just screams to me about what's right. When he's standing before Satan, puts forth his greatest battle, and then Michael the archangel says, the Lord rebuke you. You know, let the man with power fight. I'm done. I'm finished. It's not my duty to defeat you. He's already done it. The Lord rebuke you. And he steps back. That's power. But Paul had learned the the glory and pleasure of infirmities because he recognized that no matter how low he got, Christ would then more and more evident through him. More and more could could God receive the glory for everything in him? If he's weak, then Christ is strong. I've learned, I've learned that he is, that God's grace is sufficient for me. He is the source of my power. And then the last point comes back in verse 9 again. All you need is the power of Christ resting on you. That's all you need. All you have to have is the power of Christ resting on you and there is nothing that you can be defeated in. Think about the illustration back in the Old Testament when Elijah was confronting the prophets of Baal, another one of my favorites. You know, I love this story where they're doing everything they can. They're pouring petrol, using modern thoughts, pouring petrol on the fire, you know, using a magnifying glass to try and get this fire started so that the altars, you know, burn, so the sacrifices burn, and trying to make it look as if it's going to be Baal. And then when it's Elijah's turn, he knows it doesn't matter, all that stuff. Instead, he says, pour water on it, you know, and then uh, more water, more and the trench is full up. I mean, it just it's absolutely saturated and soaked. There's no way that's going to burn unless God burns it. And then there's no way that it won't burn. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. But Elijah had gotten a hold of the fact that it isn't in, listen, get this, it isn't in all those elements we think need to exist. So where are we as a church? Well, we need, we need a really, really, really good music program. We need a really, really, really beautiful building. We need really, really good singers. We need attractive people to stand at the doors. We need good coffee. You do, though. I'm going <laughs> to Okay, that's where it stops. You got to Okay. <laughs> you know, but you got to have, you got to have. And if you don't. People won't throw it out, man. You know, switch. If if God is in this, you could serve Nescafe by the teaspoon. Oh, I hate that. Sorry. You know, but you could. You really could. You could have people who 
don't fit in any of it. Singers who are off, you know, and you, you could. I mean, none of ours are, by the way. It's really you're, you're lovely, and this is not a testimony of what goes on. But, but at the same time, you could, you really, really could be awful, and God could bless it. In fact, God might even be here and not be someplace else because He really likes that. Because God gets glory in weakness. You see, then nobody, nobody could come to this church and go, oh man, I go to that church for the coffee. I go to that church for the music. I go to that church because, oh wow, you know. Then it's like, I go to that church because God's there. I can't pick, I can't, I can't put my finger on it. And I saw this all the way back when I was a teenager, about 15 years old and I attended a Bible camp and and it was rough it was rustic you get splinters in your bum on the seats it was awful you know it was just old wood floors that creaked and and it just looked awful but God was there God was there and I remember when the youth director said, next year we're going someplace really cool. They've got, you know, um, kite, human kite flying on the, and water skiing and all the rest of it. And I almost cried. No, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go where I knew God was. Where we gathered together, a few of us teens sitting on top of a big rock, holding hands and praying and knowing that God was there. In weakness, in ugliness, in infirmity, in insults, in all of those things, that's where God can get the biggest glory. So it doesn't mean trash the church on the way out. You know, it doesn't mean do anything to ruin and make it worse. It just means don't think that God's blessings are dependent upon our beauty. Because it's, his, it's our weakness that he'll bless. It's our weakness. Let's read the verses again in light of this. Hear what the Apostle Paul got a hold of that he wants us to do. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul got it. He got it. And we need to, too. Father, thank you. Thank you for meeting with us, for blessing our weakness. When we don't have a whole lot of money, you can provide everything we need. When we're small in numbers, you can just overwhelm us with your presence. Surprise us that you would come here and not go someplace else. Thank you, Father, for being everything that we need. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for every weakness that we have. And Lord, when we get set back, when something else happens, when another difficulty comes, when another part of our body aches, when another unexpected challenge is presented to us. Lord, help us to find it in ourselves to just glory and worship and praise and know that it's just another opportunity for you to get the glory for doing something else through us. Help us to get it too, like Paul did. 
Thank you.